Get ready for big cats, big bats, and big vats. On this Southern Weekend Road Trip, we're going bigger, tastier, and cuter than ever before. They're miniature pot belly pigs. Hi, little girl. We'll hit the Lone Star State, where we find handmade boots fit for any cowboy or cowgirl. And these aren't your ordinary house cats. What are these lions and tigers doing living in the middle of Texas? All the big cats eat 10 and 15 pounds of raw meat a day. Plus, we're visiting a barbecue shop where people have been known to just drop in from the sky. You have commuters coming in via parachute? And if you're looking for a southern staple, we're making macaroni and cheese so good it'll smoke anything you've ever tried. So come join the adventure as we start the Southern Weekend. Hi, I'm Molly McKitty. Thank you so much for joining us. We travel across the South looking for exciting destinations for your weekend road trips. And our first stop this time is the Lone Star State. They say everything is bigger in Texas. And at the Tiger Creek Wildlife Refuge, that's true, especially when it comes to cats. Lisa, how did you all get started owning and operating a tiger refuge in Texas? Well, I'd like to take credit for starting it, but my husband actually started the Tiger Missing Link Foundation 20 years ago. And from that spawned the Tiger Creek Wildlife Refuge that we have here. So he started that uh, from going to an auction in Tyler, Texas with exotic waterfowl. And he exchanged some, I think, Arctic fox for the tiger because he thought, this is crazy that there's a tiger at an auction in Tyler, Texas. There's something wrong with this because they're an endangered species. And so he acquired that tiger and from that started taking the tiger around and raising awareness and getting money to build what you see around you today. So where do all the tigers come from? Well, they're all abused, neglected, or displaced. So they come from an array of different uh, lifestyles. Some come from circuses. Some are private owners that are turned over to us or they're confiscated and given to us. And some come from facilities just like us that didn't have the money to keep going so they had to shut their doors. And unfortunately when that happens, you're left with all these animals that need a home. So they come to Tiger Creek and they spend the rest of their lives here, kind of their forever home. Sierra, and we're just going to give her her diet of meat here. And all the big cats eat between 10 and 15 pounds of raw meat a day. And we just put it in a food slot. 15 like pounds. pounds. Yes, ma'am. A little bit more than you'd eat at home with your family. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on the day. <laughs> Sierra came to us from Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch. But she's a really sweet girl. But they eat 10 to 15 pounds of raw meat a day. And we fast two days a week. In the wild, these guys would make a kill and they would engorge themselves on it and then they would go without eating for a couple of days to let their natural enzymes build up. So we try to mimic that here and not feed them every single day to give time for the natural enzymes in their stomach to, to build up to break down the food. So if you think about how big your fridge is at home and how much food that you put in it, think about these big guys and them eating 10 to 15 pounds of raw meat a day and what it takes to store their food. I can't even imagine. Let's go inside. And right here you see the raw meat that's laid out and being thawed. And you see it sectioned out by tray, so it's actually gonna be measured out by the time it's said and done. And each cat gets a specific pound of meat that gets given to them. And if you look behind you on this board, and then you see the section that says supplements, it will actually get calcium and uh, medicines and different things to their diet. And if one of the cats doesn't eat all 10 of the pounds, we'll then take that tray with the leftover meat and put it on the scale to measure how much they're not eating so that we can adjust their diet accordingly or be able to tell if one's sick or not. So I know you said you wanted to help out. So I've got some tongs for you. I know it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. So is what, this what I think it is? It is. It's this poop. Is poop duty. So let's pick up some poop. Target acquired. Target acquired. So it's really hard to tell when a big cat gets sick. They're not, you know, laying around and going, Mom, I've got a fever. Okay. I thought about this. So okay. one of the things we have to watch for is their poop. So 
Is it runny? Is it colored? Is it mm. solid? Uh, how many piles is it? it? Are they not pooping? Right. So every day when we come in, we pick up the poop and we take note to what it looks like. So this is a good, um, a good poop is what a we good, call it. Good <laughs> a good normal poop. Okay. So if you just put it in the bucket there, and then we'll come over here to this pile. So if you just how's, how's this pile? Look? This pile looks normal, and this one's a little bit what we would call a soft poop. Okay. And so you would just keep an eye on whoever is in this enclosure. That's right. So okay. sometimes we come out here and there'll be a really loose, runny poop, and we have to log that down. And if it's consistent, then we know that something's up and we need to review their diet or look at what's going on with them. Okay. I think that was a good yield. This bucket's pretty heavy. You all have more than just tigers here, right? And what other animals can you see? Tigers, lions, leopards, bobcats, mountain lions, and we even have a serval and a couple of Joffroy's cats. Mm -hmm. So we're using them to educate the public and the people that come out to Tiger Creek how they're all intertwined and why we need to focus on saving all the exotics as a whole. So this is Dakari here, he's the male, and then his sister Cleo is the female on the other side. Uh, they are servals and they're from Africa. And what's really cool about servals, and if we kind of crouch down over here, he'll probably come check us out right now. He's just trying to figure out what's going on in here. <laughs> but um, what's really cool about these servals is they can jump straight up in the air about 10 feet without a running start and snatch a bird straight out of the sky. And I'm gonna go get him and see if he wants to come over and say hi to Kari. Hi, baby. And they're a small cat, so they do purr. These guys will be about the size of a medium dog, somewhere about 30-ish pounds. Oh, his sister's gonna come over here and say hello now. And this is to Kari. If you wanna sit down, I'm literally gonna just oh, set him right in your lap. I would love that. Uh-oh. <laughs> He's like, ooh. Yeah, he might, he might not wanna sit. If he tries to get down, just let him go. <laughs> He's Sorry. like, ah. Sometimes they'll let you hold them and sometimes they won't. They're real nervous of the cameras and stuff right now. Let me get Cleo. Cleo! So I'm gonna bring him up and have I... pet his back. Cleo. She's, she's a little nervous of the cameras right now. <laughs> if you wanna bend down and pet her back, you can pet her back and feel how soft she is. They're not gonna have it, are you? <laughs> Come here, guys. hope that visitors can come away with after visiting. Us having this wildlife refuge gives us a platform to be able to teach the public that they're not pets, not to go and poach them, and to help conserve their natural environments. And we hope by being here that we can use these cats that happen to be in captivity for the rest of their lives to teach them that. Up next, What's a trip to Texas without getting a great pair of boots? These handcrafted beauties will have you boot scoot and boogie in. Welcome back to the Southern Weekend. Texas and cowboys go hand in hand, but you can't call yourself a true cowboy or cowgirl without a good pair of boots. So we stopped by the Mercedes Boot Company to see how their handcrafted footwear is made with a Texas-sized personal touch. So what is it about these boots that make them different from everybody else's? Probably the design factor and that we we spend a lot of time with the customer finding out exactly what they want. So you can come in and pick out every little individual section every, of how to piece your boots Everything from the toe to the heel to how tall you want them to all the colors and brands, initials, logos, inlays, overlays. Then you get the boot that's, that says exactly who you are, what you want to do, and it's limitless. So how does the whole process start? We start first with um, getting the customer measured and determining how tall they want them. They pick out their leathers and what kind of style they want, the toe, the heel, the top scallop cut, all of that. Then we get into the colors and then whatever bells and whistles they want. They want stitching, they want their initials, they want their alma mater logo, wedding date or corporate logo. Once you get everything picked out, we get the patterns made for your size. They get cut, it's done when it's flat. 
We sew them all together, the side seam and the ear pulls, and they look like a finished boot. There's just no sole and heel on them. Mm -hmm. Then they go to the back and they get wrapped around a last that's been custom built to match your measurements, and then the soles and heels and gifts and finished out. So how long does the process typically take from start to finish? Well, with 250 steps, it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> you know, it can, you can do it in about two weeks, you know, and that's with your drying time. But if there's a lot more detail work to be done on the top, sometimes you can spend three days just on a set of tops. And how much would one of these boots set a customer back if they <laughs> purchase one? Our boots start at $12.95 and go up from there. That's not $12.95. $1,295. $1, and so true. they'll come in here and they'll buy one of ours and they'll last them 10, 15 years. And it custom fits their foot. And it fits their <laughs> foot, yeah. It's comfortable. The only thing left to do, try some on. Ooh. They're really comfortable. <laughs> Last but not least. Ooh, these might be my favorite. Oh yeah. This is my favorite. Done. Sold. Where do I sign? When we return, we stop at one of the most inspirational locations we've ever been to to pay tribute to a true American hero. If you want to see more from any of our road trips, check out thesouthernweekend.com. You'll find videos of our adventures across the South, as well as great tips and recipes. All that and more anytime you want it at thesouthernweekend.com. Welcome back to the Southern Weekend. Museums are always great places to visit on any road trip, and one of the most inspirational ones we've ever seen is in Montgomery, Alabama. The Rosa Parks Library and Museum is a living monument to the mother of the civil rights movement, who took a stand by staying in her seat. The Rosa Parks Museum is a place where the public can gather to learn about the legacy of Mrs. Parks and pay reverence to the grassroots effort of the African American community to come together and boycott the Montgomery City buses and to pay tribute to those individuals. The content in this museum covers a darker period in our history, but when you get here, it doesn't feel like that. If anything, it feels inspirational. We're always trying to get visitors to push the envelope a little bit and, and uh, think outside of the box regarding civil rights, regarding what they think a museum experience should be. This is our orientation room. In the orientation room, our visitors will actually see a 10 minute video of the frustrations of individuals who were a part of the bus boycott. The bus boycott was really a turning point for the civil rights movement. It really was. It, uh, it provided um, a push, if you will, um, into many more issues that were going on. It, it was that domino that started the other dominoes that led to so many other civil rights issues being brought to light. What an honor to be among these faces. Yeah, it is. So many, so many. They all played a part in the bus boycott. From Dr. King to Ralph Abernathy to Fred Gray, the attorney, the prominent attorney, Joanne Robinson, uh, the very articulate Joanne Robinson, who was the architect of the bus boycott. And speaking of the bus boycott, we actually have a replica of the bus in the next room. Really? Yeah, well, let's go check it out. Life-size bus. Let's go check it out. Oh. oh. Yeah, here it is. So is this an exact replica? This is an exact replica of the bus that Mrs. Parks was arrested on. Life Color size. Color and everything. Color and everything. Um, and actually what would happen, um, blacks would actually have to get on the front of the bus to pay their fare and get off the front and enter through the back. You're kidding. Yeah, yeah. It was a very interesting time. Geographically in Montgomery, the city, where did this take place? Actually, where you're standing right now. This is the actual site of the Empire Theater. Um, if you actually walk out front, you'll actually see a placard showing the very spot where she was arrested, where the bus stop was. But this is the actual site of the Empire Theater. How many museums can claim that about their existence? Not too many that I know <laughs> of. Holy Not cow. too many. 
Do you think Mrs. Parks knew in that moment what her decision would do for this movement moving forward? It's a very good question. I just know she was tight. She was tired of being pushed. She was tired of not only her being pushed, but everyone that looked like her, walked like her, and talked like her being pushed. And she sat down. She sat down to stand up for justice. I really think that museums serve a purpose to educate the public in unique ways and, and without using a textbook, without being in a traditional classroom setting. So our children's wing features the Cleveland Avenue Time Machine, which is a remake of a 1955 Montgomery City bus, and children actually get on this bus and they are quote unquote driven through time by a robot, Mr. Rivets. I will ask your driver to speed you back in time. To it's a media experience, so all around them, they're watching a film uh, of Jim Crow laws and what, what happened in the South um, from the time of Plessy versus Ferguson and, and the whole separate but equal decision all the way up to 1955 when Mrs. Parks was arrested. So they're looking at the way of life in the South and how things were separated. And so it, it is a challenge to explain that to children. So we use the time machine to kind of um, tackle those issues. So you hope that folks that tour here take away more of a human rights mission statement than just focusing on the civil rights movement. At the end of the day, we are Americans and we are, we should all be united. And there are so many of us, but out of many, we're one, right? I think that we should try to live by that motto. And at the Rosa Parks Museum, we're trying our best to honor her legacy in doing so. Sevierville is tucked into the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains. We're right beside Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And Sevierville has a lot of fun things for people to do. We're outside at Lake Wilderness here at Wilderness at the Smokies. We are an indoor water park resort. We don't only just have an indoor water park. We have two outdoor water parks as well as the Adventure Forest, which is our dry play facility. So we're family friendly. Of course, we have plenty to do for families of all ages, whether it's the youngest or the youngest at heart. We're actually at Rainforest Adventures. This is sort of an indoor-outdoor zoo. Many of our animals have been born here, so it's quite literally home to, to monkeys and lemurs that call the Smokies home. If you're looking for a challenge, something adventurous, something fun to do, um, great things here such as the Tennessee Museum of Aviation, which is an opportunity for you to see aircraft from World War II through Vietnam. To walk through our museum is like going through history. The Tennessee Museum of Aviation is actually a, a rare gem because most museums just have static airplanes that sit and do not fly, but we've got airplanes that fly here. We've also got biplane flights. So you want to come, you want to feel like a barnstormer, you can do that right here over the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. It's essentially like riding in a convertible, except uh, you know, you're a thousand feet up in the air. And the views, especially here in Sevierville, are just spectacular. We've got the Smoky Mountains as a backdrop, which is really something to see from the air. We also have some great ropes adventure courses and zipline courses, so you can really get out there in the treetops and experience these mountains in a whole new way. And Sevierville is a destination all in itself. I mean, we see about 10 million visitors per year come through the area, so there's plenty to offer here in the community. Wonderful people, great scenery, fantastic weather. It is a fantastic place. Really, whatever you want to do on vacation, you can find right here. On our weekend road trips, we get to sample delicious food created by some of the best chefs in the South. One of our favorites is Felicia Willett, head chef at Felicia Suzanne's in Memphis, Tennessee, and she showed us how to put a smoky spin on a southern staple. Hey, it's Felicia, and we're making smoky mac and cheese. So we're going to start making the bechamel. In a saucepan, I'm going to add my butter. We're going to make sure we melt the butter, and we're going to be making the bechamel, which is a milk sauce. We're going to be making a blonde roux with flour, 
butter, and then we're gonna whisk in some milk. So we've got our butter melted. We're gonna add our flour. We're gonna whisk our flour, making sure we've got no lumps. We're gonna let that cook for just a moment, about a minute. We're gonna whisk in the milk a little bit at a time till we get everything incorporated. And the key here is when you're whisking, you wanna make sure you're covering all sides of the pot because we don't wanna have a lumpy bechamel. We're gonna season our sauce with some salt, some white pepper, and what makes a bechamel besides the blonde roux with milk is a pinch of nutmeg. We're gonna bring that up to a boil, reduce it down to a simmer, and we're gonna cook it for about eight minutes. So our sauce is nice and thick. We're gonna fold in our pasta just right into the pot. So about five cups of cooked pasta. Then we're gonna add our cheese. I'm using a smoked cheddar cheese for this to kind of give it a nice little smoky flavor. We're gonna put half the cheese into the pasta mixture. Then we're gonna reserve the other half to go on top of the mac and cheese before it goes into the oven. And then right at the end, I'm gonna add just a little bit of hot sauce to it. Not really for spice, but more of a, an acid, kind of bring out the flavors of the bechamel and the cheese and the pasta. And we're gonna spray our pan so our pasta doesn't stick. And then we're just gonna carefully pour all of the pasta into the pan. And with our remaining smoked cheddar, we're just gonna sprinkle it right over the top of our pasta. We're gonna go to the oven and bake until it's golden. So it's out of the oven and it smells delicious. Let's give it a taste. Oh, look at that. The pasta, the cheese is just oozing in there. Mm. So what I love about using smoked cheddar cheese in this dish is one, the cheddar cheese will make it so creamy, and then I just love that hint of smoke right at the end. Delicious. Still to come, we roll into one of our favorite southern cities and visit a spot that's always a big hit for baseball fans. Welcome back to the Southern Weekend. I'm Molly McKinney. Spring is just around the corner, which means baseball season isn't far behind. Now you could head on down to Florida to catch spring training and get your early baseball fix, or you could visit Louisville, Kentucky and the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory to see how their iconic baseball bats are made. PJ. Molly, nice hey, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having us here. Welcome to Louisville Slugger. This is a big bat. It is, 120 feet tall. It's made out of carbide steel, and it's an exact replica of Babe Ruth's bat. Come on, really? Yeah. Wow, it's bigger than most of the buildings on this block. Yeah, you can see it from pretty much anywhere in Louisville. Can't wait to see what you have inside if this is at the entrance. Yeah, absolutely. Come on, check it out. I think vault is the appropriate word to describe this room. Yes, welcome to the bad vault. We call this the Fort Knox of Louisville Slugger. It's a great word for it. We have some white gloves over here. We got to handle these artifacts with some white gloves. Now yeah. our cataloging system is pretty simple. It's a letter followed by a number. So in other words, A99 model. That's a Hank Aaron model. He was the 99th guy with the last name that started with A to have created a model for us. <laughs> Now the ones that you're standing by over here, uh, you're looking at the R43 over here. That's the Babe Ruth model. Oh. So here's the R43 model. What wood is this? This is actually ash. This is that's so northern white ash. Wow, this is sentimental. This yeah, is that's really part of a really incredible. important part of our company history there. And so what you're looking at here, this is really a priceless part of not only company history, but baseball history that's contained in this room. Wow. So what we're looking at here, these are called billets, B-I-L-L-E-T. That's what we're gonna use to shape into our baseball bats. You can hold that. It's about a five it's pound piece heavy, of wood. Yeah. yeah, it's about five pounds and we're gonna turn it into about a two pound baseball bat. Cool, so what's the next part of the process? 
Next part, we're going to take it to our lathe and we're going to shape into a baseball bat. Okay. Do you want to actually take this one or we'll sure. put it back? Yeah, we're going to put this one back. <laughs> So where we are now, these are our Hempel production lathes. So we're going to use a forklift to load up these green cages with billets. Okay. The billets are then fed into the lathes automatically. They'll be uh, spun about 3,000 revolutions per minute. We'll have a template loaded into that machine. It looks like this template over here. As that billet's spinning at 3,000 RPMs, a series of five blades will follow this template moving across that billet. One pass, 30 seconds, we'll have a baseball bat. So what we're looking at here, this is our burn branding machine here, and this is the traditional way we're gonna brand our ash bats. We've got a metal template on that machine. It's heated up to 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. And Rhonda's gonna roll our bats over them and literally burn them and brand them. Ah, oh, that is so neat. Give that a sniff. Oh, that smell nice? That smells <laughs> like campfire and marshmallows and all that's right with the world. Aside from the tours, you also have a museum. Yeah, we've got an incredible museum that, that our visitors can, can really check out and see, and we've got some really wonderful artifacts in there. We've got a Joe DiMaggio bat from his 56-game hitting streak. We've got Hank Aaron's 700th home run bat. One of the really neat things is we have a section there called Hold a Piece of History. Visitors come in there, they can get their hands on game-used artifacts. You pose and take the picture with it, hold a Mickey Mantle bat or a Johnny Bench bat or a Derek Jeter, actual game-used bats. After that, they can stare down a 90 mile power fastball, which is a whole lot of fun. So there's a lot of interactive, a lot of great, great stuff to get some hands on, and then there's a lot of great artifacts to see in our museum as well. PJ, gotta say it, I think you knocked that tour out of the park. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> well, thanks I'll for let coming. you put this back, but okay. thank you so much for having us. I think I'm gonna go check out the museum and see if I can get some swings in at that batting cage. I may try Babe Ruth. Great, thank you. This is fun. It's kind of a workout. This is what I need to do instead of going to the gym. Coming up, what's the connection between rock and roll and brandy? We'll see how music pumps flavor into a Louisville spirit when the Southern Weekend continues. Welcome to the Southern Weekend. We're here with Joe Heron, who owns Copper and Kings, a distillery in Louisville, Kentucky. Let's start by acknowledging the elephant in the room. You own a distillery, but you own a distillery that is not the common liquor of choice here in I Louisville. I thought you were talking about me when you said the elephant in the room. <laughs> I was getting kind of shy now. You don't own a bourbon distillery in no. Louisville. We own an American brandy distillery in Louisville, Kentucky. You're not originally from here. What brought you here? I'm from the south. I'm from the far south, from South Africa. So, far uh, south. so it's very far south. Um, but we came down to start the brandy distillery. This is why we're here. So that's a bold business decision. We live in a state and it, that has tremendous high quality bourbons that are delicious. Whereas if you look at American brandy, there's essentially no overtly American brandy. Well, this facility is so beautiful. I can't wait to take a look around. Oh, let's go downstairs. Let's start at the stills. Was that subtle enough? Did yeah, you yeah. tell that I was ready? <laughs> So Molly, I'm going to introduce you to our three ladies okay. because they're all, our stills are all named after women in Bob Dylan songs. <laughs> and so we have Isis, we have Magdalena, and we have Sarah, who is Bob Dylan's prettiest <laughs> wife. I actually don't know what brandy is and how it's made. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> so I'm a good you're not, you're not alone, you're not alone. <laughs> so here's the cheat sheet. So whiskey is distilled beer and brandy is distilled wine. And the process of using copper has been used for, for centuries because copper actually detoxifies uh, the alcoholic vapors of, of, of sulfites and bad odors and things like that. So these stills are actually directly designed in a style that's made for brandy distillation. So this is called a, an alembic helmet or brandy onion. That is called a swan neck. And then we have a condenser and that's your process. Boil it, start condensing it, start condensing, condense, and finish. So it's a 
a process that's quite slow relative to uh, to other distillation products. So How long does the whole process take? From probably start about to eight hours. Here's a number that you should know. It takes five tons of grapes to make one barrel of brandy. Do you know this before you did a startup mm, brandy distillery? No. <laughs> I wish I did. You know now. I know now. <laughs> What are all the things people get to see on the tours here? Well, you obviously can see the process of distillation. And then they can walk down into the basement and uh, we actually have a very interesting process in that we age our brandy and Kentucky bourbon barrels, but we mature them with rock and roll. to collide then they hit the wall of the barrel and they come back again because and it starts to form this distillate wave inside the the barrels which increases the frequency of contact which enhances maturation so i yeah. would believe anything that you say right <laughs> now <laughs> so this is how i drink brandy over ice no smoking jackets, no brandy sniffers, over ice. Isn't that the best part? Yeah, this is America. We drink it like we want to drink it. <laughs> feels lighter. So, yeah, feels a little fresher, a little lighter. And so now for what's called the Copper and King's Express. This is a very simple way of expressing the orange peel inside your glass. Smells oh, great. That's good, huh? Let's have some more. I could drink that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I should start. This has been such a neat learning experience, and I can see why so many people come here when they're in Louisville, Kentucky. Did I say it right? Yes, you did. You said, no. <laughs> you, said, you said it like almost everybody else that doesn't come from Louisville. <laughs> This Clemson farm is producing sustainable organic food. They're miniature pot belly pigs. Hi, little guy. And happens to have the cutest animals ever. You won't want to miss this. If you want to see more from any of our road trips, check out thesouthernweekend.com. You'll find videos of our adventures across the South, as well as great tips and recipes. All that and more anytime you want it at thesouthernweekend.com. Clemson is located in a really rural part of South Carolina, so there are lots of farms and green space nearby, and within just a 10 minute drive of the university is Split Creek Goat Farm. So I love animals, I had to make this a pit stop, I'm excited to go check it out. So how long have you been here? Um, since 1993. So you like it here? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> what is it that got you to stay all this time? Um, the love of the animals um, and wanting to see a farm succeed. How many animals do you have here? Um, depends on the day. Um, <laughs> right now, I think we've got about 450 total. Golly. Yeah, a little, little bit of everything. It's, it's kind of a, a zoo and a farm. I love that you all are open to the public, but as a tourist, I can come to a real working farm and oversee this operation. Yeah, and we want the public to see what a working farm is all about, what we do here. Not everybody gets to see that these no. days. I'd love to see inside the barn if yeah, it's okay. Yeah, sure. You mind showing me? Oh, wow, what's that noise? That is the motor for the milking machine. Yeah, we milk twice a day, every day, rain or shine or Christmas mornings. You all make a lot of products. Oh, yeah. With this. To make our cheese, to make our soap, to make our fudge, to make our lotions, our yogurts. <gasps> so these are our babies. Oh my gosh, they're so little. Hi, baby. Her name is Slipper. She's our last baby born for this year. Do you want to come out and say hello? Look yes. at her little tail. Yeah. Is Slipper a girl or a boy? Slipper is a girl. Hi. Here, you hold her. I, I will gladly. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi. 
Princess. How old is Snooper? Snooper is 10 days old. How many goats did you start with on the farm? Um, Evan, who started this farm originally in 1977, um, she started out with one goat named Sarah. Um, and all of all of our Alpines and our Nubians originated from that from that one goat named Sarah. Really? Yeah. really? Yeah. We outcross. We bring in a, a new boy here or there, but okay. but <laughs> the DNA the DNA can trace back to that one girl. I want to take her home. I can, right? That's part of the tour. <laughs> Everyone gets to right. take home a Everybody baby goat. Everybody gets a free goat. <laughs> I'm so old. Run. Do you have room for me on the farm? Oh, yeah. Just come, oh, yeah. <laughs> come stay here forever. You want to go back with your friends? Thank you yeah. for letting me hold you. Oh, gosh. Go be with your brother. Go on. Oh, no. She wants to come <laughs> back. She it's can, a sign. She can probably come with us. This will be good. We're training her for being a tour guide on the farm. We start at 10 days old. Yeah. You can bring her with us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I got you a brew. What you want with us? Whoa. Come on, come on, come on, let's go. <laughs> so obviously goats aren't the only animals here at Split Creek. So one of our rescue pigs, um, unbeknownst to us, was pregnant. So here are here are the results of that. <laughs> oh my gosh! What kind of pigs are these? Um, they're miniature pot belly pigs. Hi, little guy. Yeah, we're working on socialization. How old are they? Um, they're three weeks old now. Oh, oh, oh you guys have some teeth in they there. They do have some teeth. I didn't teeth. realize yeah. that. <laughs> Milk time. All right, here's dinner. Is this goat's milk? It is. Yeah. Really? <laughs> That goat's milk is good for everybody. I didn't realize that you could give goat's milk across species. Oh yeah, yeah, goat's milk is sort of like the universal donor. Um, really? People that are lactose intolerant can usually handle goat's milk when they can't handle other. Why is that? It's got shorter chain fatty acids, so your body can break it down, process it e easier. They can be transferred to, to goat's milk and do very well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. What a great base for all of your products. Exactly. It's so rare to be able to tour a facility and see the, the start to finish of a process and yeah. get to eat it. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. the bonus of all Let's be real. That's what I'm excited about. Yes. So what do we have here? Um, this is our chef, which is a French-style sliceable cheese. We're sampling a pesto. Um, this is our award-winning feta, marinating olive oil with sun-dried tomatoes and an Italian herb mix. And of course, the to die for goat milk fudge. I'm gonna start with this one because it seems like the easiest. Thank you. Whoa, oh my gosh. Man, yeah. don't change a thing about those recipes. Thank you. Thank I could you. eat those all day. I haven't even gotten to the fudge. I don't think That's you can do best. anything wrong That's with fudge. That's the best. And this one is a plain, we also do a pecan, walnut, and chocolate peanut butter layered. Of course you do. So I can hold baby goats here, I can eat all of this. Uh, I'm gonna have to settle up here for life. <laughs> Not good? Yes. This is my last episode of The Southern Weekend. I'm gonna become a goat farmer. You'll know where to find me. Come visit. This is awesome. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on The Southern Weekend, we journey to the Gulf Coast where old license plates, used parachutes, and grade A barbecue all call this place home. Welcome back to the Southern Weekend. If the South is known for one thing, it's barbecue. And though you may think all barbecue joints are basically the same, I bet you haven't seen anything like we saw in Ocean Springs, Mississippi at a place called The Shed. Wow! <laughs> the shed in all its glory, right? Oh, this place is nice. <laughs> like anything I've ever seen before. And beer service. I just call it the shed. It's a junkadelic courtyard. So when I, I came up with the word what to describe this place, family, food, drink, or <laughs> We came up with that word 14 years ago! When people come in, especially when the kids say, oh, I want to go get that at the shed, that's when I get all happy and giddy inside. Same thing when I see a kid actually enjoy some blues music. Barbecue, blues, and cold beer. And southern hospitality above uh, and beyond. At its finest. 
We take these to go. For a treat, yeah. Oh yeah, sister. we definitely have. <laughs> You're in for a treat. Do you all know everything that you have in here? Actually, we do. The shed story started with Brad being a dumpster diver and collecting all of this yeah. stuff while he was in college. And then he came home and wanted to open a restaurant. And I was little sister in college myself. You still are little and sister. <clears throat> Even though Actually, let me tell you what, buddy. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Um, but I was in college, my, you know, when he graduated and came home and he had all of his dumpster diving finds. He said, well, I'm going to build this little barbecue joint. And not only did the family get involved with that, but the community became involved. And we started having things like our tacky chandelier contest, people bringing <laughs> their license tags, and just anything that, you know, everything has a story behind it. Parachute? So that is a parachute. What a lot of people don't realize when they come into the shed by automobile is that we have a 500 foot pier. We also have 19 acres. So we have guys that are coming in in semis and cars, planes, trains, automobiles, but jumps. also skydiving in. Are you telling the truth right now? <laughs> yes. Totally. It's, really? Uh, I mean, the shed is not just another barbecue joint. You have commuters coming in via parachute? That's, and this guy said, hey, he's retiring the parachute, but he couldn't find a better place, and guess what? It's still hanging here at the shed. So you can get to the shed any way your heart desires, and we'll be here with cold beer, barbecue, and the blues. Is this what you had pictured when you started this place 14 years ago, or has this just been it's, a culmination of what's It's what what's I happened. pictured, you know, that we got a lot of junk hanging out. But essentially, what puts us on the map is the food's good. No matter what, it comes down to the barbecue. Don't be scared now. All right, and you just want me to just sprinkle? I want you to hook it up now. Oh, oh, hey, all right. Is that good? good. You happy See with that? It? Extra, yep. We keep it really, really simple because you know what? It's all about the beat. It's all about all the beat. All about the beat. Then they make the song. <laughs> Salt and pepper, a little bit so of good. granulated it garlic. So good. In the South, we do it different. We we do that sweet Southern oh, tomato man. base. Uh -huh. And there goes and my phone. And you're getting fire from the show, Brooke. <laughs> She's out. Got a little bit of love on your hands. It's fine. All right. We gotta I'm make give sure that the, the fire is rolling here. Okay. You this use thing. real wood for this? I don't know uh, why all, I was always thinking it was pecan wood. Pecan wood. Why pecan always. wood? Pecan actually has a derivative of uh, vanilla in the cellulose of the wood, which sounds so crazy. Really? But it makes sense. Wow. This is the real deal. Yeah. Yep. Just set it right in. Kick that door over. A high five, uh, salt and salt. pepper. <laughs> That's why we do it here at the shed. Going to hyperspeed right now and see what the end Sorry, result buddy. is. So, 16 hours later, wow, you can see the smoke coming off of that. It's one of the best things that ever invented. It smells like so much garlic and deliciousness. This is what it's all about for us. Gosh, look at nice, that. Nice, juicy. Perfect slices. We want it to be able to just fall apart right here. Boom. That is so moist and tender. Wow. This is what makes good barbecue. Wow. I didn't even know you could do that with brisket. <laughs> I didn't either. Now that my hands are so <laughs> juicy. It's all about Southern hospitality, barbecue, brews, and beer. We get to start great weekends, and we get to end great weekends. So. <laughs> Another cheer said that. To your one, next right? Southern weekend. <laughs> That wraps up this road trip. I'm Molly McKinney. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great Southern weekend. 